recording. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another session of the Library of Things collab. Today's session is going to be all about funding, uh, looking at you know generating it. So from fundraising, sales, and late fees, and other different ways that you can make funds with the Library of Things. Mm -hmm. um, but then also looking at a case study that we've got from a tool sale in Seattle, uh, or rather a couple of them. And we're going to finish up by um, taking taking kind of a, won't say necessarily a deep dive, but definitely a good look at, at budgeting, you know, both like, you know, from initial budgeting to sustaining what it means to uh, manage um, grant funds and, and also relationships. So because as Candace was just mentioning a moment ago, we have, it's a very packed, packed session. I'm going to go ahead and just hand it right off to Leanna. Um, and this, the last thing I'll say is as you have questions, you can see the shareable team as we do from week to week. We've all got pizzas before our name. So feel free to send us a direct message if you want or message the crowd and we'll be grabbing um, uh, questions from the chat as well. So we'll have uh, an opportunity for questions after each one of these presenters, just like we did last week. And then hopefully at the end of the session, we'll be able to have some more time to talk. And as we've been doing, we'll be leaving the room open for an additional 15 minutes for anybody who wants to stick around and chat. And all of these, these sessions will be recorded. We'll share the transcript. We'll share the, the chat uh, transcript as well and the, the video of, of this session. And it will all be shared on Canvas afterwards. So if you miss anything, you can go right back and find it. So with that, uh, Leanne, are you ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. So, hey everyone, I'm Liana Frick. I'm the co-director of the Station Earth Tool Library. Um, I'm gonna just get us started. These are your presenters. The first one, um, you're gonna get to hear from Josh and Amanda in a bit, and I have to leave the session early, so apologies in advance that I will not be here at the very end. But I, um, I'm a certified fundraising executive. My um, professional background has been about 15 years in fundraising, so super excited to tell you the basics. Um, I've also uploaded uh, some templates and guides and samples and other things, or Candace has uploaded them. I just sent them to her. They're in Canvas. Um, but if you think of other things that I might mention that would be helpful, um, feel free to put it in the chat. And if, if I have it available, I'll certainly share it. Okay. So the first thing to think about when you want to raise some money is what are you raising money for? Um, and so there is a, a template for a case for support in Canvas, um, but basically a case for support is um, your starting place for all things. So it could be turned into a grant application, it can be turned into a fundraising letter, it can be turned into uh, crowdfunding messaging and emails, but really the most important thing is that it helps you understand what it is you're trying to do, why it's important, what do you need to get it done? Um, and so the two biggest questions really are what will be different when we accomplish our goal, when we get our library things open, when we launch this, educational program, when we buy this new tool, what will be different about the world, about our neighborhood, about um, the community that we're in? And then how much does it cost? Um, so putting together a budget, Amanda's going to talk about that later, um, but really thinking through all of the things that are involved um, in getting from here to there, where there is somewhere awesome. Okay, then you need to make a plan. So we know what we want to raise fund funds for, who's going to do it, and how are they going to do it? So my biggest recommendation is do not try to take this all on yourself. So if you're here because you want to start a tool lending library or a kitchen gear library um, or whatever, make sure that you have a team behind you uh, working with you. And a really good way to get people involved is um, to get them involved in fundraising because it means that they will really understand what they're doing. They'll be really bought in and you will weed out the people who are not willing to work hard. Um, so getting a committee together to help you fundraise is really important. Ned is going to talk later about um, your budget. So kind of chunking things like maybe we could get a grant to cover an inventory increase, or we could get a grant to cover food for all of our meetings or for this specific event. So start to think about where you could group expenses together and talk about those costs. And then you want to research um, where you might find funding. So um, hopefully in the future, we'll get a chance to dive more into how to find grants to apply for. But a good place to start is similar organizations. So organizations in your city um, are the best place to start. Most grants are location-based. 
Um, but you know, you can look at which corporations are giving. So when you're out and about, um, and you're at events and things like that, look and see who is listed as a sponsor. And then you want to set clear, specific goals to match this potential money that you've found with the needs that you have identified. Um, and that could look something like this. Um, so this is going to look similar to what Amanda is going to present um, in terms of budgeting, but this is really a fundraising plan. This is a very, very basic one where you're thinking about, okay, this is a source of money. This is how much I think we're going to get from them. This is when we'll know if we got it or not. And here's who's in charge of this, right? And so this kind of plan altogether includes any grants you might apply for, any crowdfunding campaigns, fundraising events and individual people who you might be asking for money of, you know, a sort of a substantial amount when you're going to say like, hey, I know you have a lot of money. How about you give us $1,000 or $5,000 or $50,000? Um, so you want to sit down and get all of your potential sources of income in one place and then make a plan for how you're going to get them and when you're going to know whether you were successful. So in addition to thinking about what kinds of grants or corporations might support you, those are like big chunks of money that you could go for, but they take a lot of work and they're generally short term. You want to think about the people also who might support you. So a lot of tool libraries, are ours included, rely on crowdfunding, which is another topic. Hopefully we'll get to explore more in the future. Um, and crowdfunding really requires you to think about who's in your network. Um, the great thing about crowdfunding is I, as the leader of fundraising, um, I might recruit 10 people to be on my fundraising team, and then they are each going to go ask a bunch of people. So it's sort of an exponential return on your investment when you do crowdfunding. But even if you or someone on your team is just going out and asking people for money, it can get easier and easier over time. You can templatize it. But first, you need to know who are you going to ask, right? Um, and it is really common when you're thinking about potential donors to say, oh, well, we're going to ask everyone who lives in the block where the tool library is, or we're going to ask every uh, everyone who came to our fall fundraiser, we're going to ask for a donation. But that is a really hard category of people to act on because they're not associated with like names, email addresses, phone numbers. Um, so as much as possible, when you're talking about the kinds of people who you'd like to ask for money, make sure that you know who those people are, not just what category they're in or what demographic they're in or how to find them. So do the work up front when you have all the energy in the room with your fundraising group to think about the very, very specific people. And if you're talking about companies, who is someone at that company? Like who is the individual person that you will send that email to, that you will call? Um, and that is that is one of my biggest recommendations is be specific up front. And then um, I can't really see anyone, but show of hands, who's here is uh, afraid or nervous to ask for money? Yeah. Good. I'm glad Robbie didn't raise his hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So my biggest trick in, and you can use this with your fundraising committee, is just close your eyes. Think about that fear that you have of asking someone for money and then put it aside. And then think about the last time you were asked to support something that you really believed in. Think about the last time that you donated to something that you care about. And how did you feel as a donor? Especially if someone asked you to contribute to something and you were like, oh yeah, thank you so much for thinking of me. Like, I do care about that. I have asked this question of hundreds of people and I have never heard someone say they didn't enjoy the feeling of contributing to something that they believe in. And so instead of asking someone to give something up, instead of asking someone to give you money, think about it as asking someone to participate or giving them the opportunity to feel that great, the way that you felt the last time you did something that you care about. And so think of it as an invitation um, instead of an ask, right? And there is, um, there is research in philanthropy that, that indicates that the more people give away, the wealthier they feel, right? So altruism, philanthropy, maybe, but altruism for sure, generosity is one of the few things that's like really good for us as individuals and also really good for us as a society. Um, so fundraising can be really wonderful. It can be really joyful. It can be really relational. Um, you just have to start from a place of an invitation instead of, oh, I'm so sorry to ask, but would you, would you please give us some money? 
Instead, you could use the phrase, hey, would you consider, would you consider is fundraising gold? Everyone uses this phrase. Would you consider a gift of $25? Would you consider joining us as a fundraiser on our crowdfunding campaign? Because the worst someone can say is no. I have never in all of my years fundraising heard of anyone who got in a fight, whose aunt never talked to them again because they asked them to contribute to this project that they care about. Uh, the worst someone can say is like, no, not right now. Um, but the phrase, would you consider, is such a good trick. Okay. And then you, okay, so you figured out why you need the money and what it's going to be different when you get it. You figured out who you're going to ask, how you're going to go ask for that money. And you've put people in charge of each of those tasks. So then like, how do you do it? Um, I put a lot of stock into getting all of your collateral ready ahead of time. So you have that case for support. You have some language around what you want to do already written. You have your boilerplate. Uh, uh, I got to, while you're up there, I got to call. From, uh, back to I really members. recommend, um, if you're not already familiar with Canva, um, this is an online, um, sort of graphic design tool. It's putting a lot of graphic designers out of business, I'm sure. Um, but it is free for nonprofits and even the free for everyone version is great. It's very easy to use. So create a set of images that you can use on social media, um, look up the different formats, um, aspect ratios for that. Um, and then consider a crowdfunding campaign. I mentioned that before. I recommend GiveButter. It's the platform we use. I'll show you in a sec. Um, and then really do go out there and ask specific people for money. It is absolutely the most effective way to do this. Even if it's part of a crowdfunding campaign, you can't get around just asking a specific person to give you a donation. You have to do it. So practice, get good at it, get comfortable with it. You can also um, consider low lift fundraising events. This is a great one um, to get in the chat on Canva um, and share like what has been successful for you so that other people can replicate it in their cities. Um, or if you have an idea, you can say like, hey, has anyone done a pint night or a fundraiser at a restaurant like this? Is it worth it? Um, this is a really great way to share success and ideas. So this is an example of our, we do a crowdfunding campaign every year in the fall um, to meet our, our budget gap. So the gap between what we um, earned and what we need. Um, we typically raise between 20 and $40,000 from our community. And if anyone wants to talk more about crowdfunding, I've been doing this for years as a volunteer, happy to share. Um, but you can also do it for specific things. If you wanna start a library, if you wanna buy something big or you need to move, um, this is the DC tool library had a break in and needed to replace a lot of items in their inventory. And you'll see both of these campaigns exceeded their goal. Um, both of us also raised our goals. Um, crowdfunding can be really, really powerful and it's a great way to build your base. And then the last thing I'll say is before you even start asking, think about how you're gonna say thank you. Um, we don't like name things after people. We don't send donor gifts, but we do make a really good point to say thank you and really mean it. So we make these hand printed cards. Um, I send this donor newsletter. Um, I think I, I sent Candace a copy of this. Um, this is just a quarterly update. Like, Hey, you've, if you've ever given us money, here's the cool stuff we're doing. Thanks to money. Thanks to you. Um, and it's a really great way to get people involved at the very, like who are like a little tentative about fundraising, get them involved first in thinking. So you can have folks get together, maybe your volunteers or your members um, can get together and just like write a quick little note and sign a handwritten card it goes a super long way to having that person donate again. Um, and, or you can have people make phone calls. Um, people love picking up the phone and thinking it's spam and then hearing a real human being be like, hey, I'm just going to say thank you, you're great. Um, it really built a lot of goodwill. And think about not just the individuals who donate, but the people who represent companies, um, the program officers at grant makers, they're real people too. Um, just like you have to think about who you're gonna ask, think about how you're gonna follow up and say thank you to real people for helping you meet your goal. Um, that is actually it for me. Told you I'd get under 15 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm not sure if I'm passing to Josh or if we wanted to do any Q&A now. Yeah, we want to do some some Q and A now. Okay. So those, uh, anybody got any questions for Liana? I know there are some things going on in the chat, um, and also some people answering things as we went. But there was a there was definitely a question about the tracking of economic impact that 
an LOT has on the community and wondering if you've done any of that work yet. We, uh, we've really struggled with this. I will say um, there is research coming out about maker spaces. We also have a maker space um, and mm. um, about the economic impact of maker spaces. What we do is we occasionally will look at our really high value items, like our floor finishing equipment and compare the price to rental or purchase. Um, and so I can say, you know, we've saved our members $126,000 over the last 10 years um, if they had had to rent those tools from Home Depot or whatever. Uh, but I'm really curious if other libraries of things have have done that. I know um, there are university partnerships that can be really good for that. So Buffalo, maybe we could ask them since they partner with the university. Yeah, I will say, oh, go ahead. Oh, outside of grants, stats aren't as important as you think that they are. Um, if you're talking to people, they want to hear about people. So people give to people, not to organizations is another big mantra in fundraising. Yeah. And, and Lissa was going to jump in, I think maybe from Buffalo. Yeah. Um, uh, I was just going to mention that we, so we hooked up with UB, which is our, our university, uh, state university down the street. And they were able to get us somebody on a paid internship, both over the summer and also through their work study program. Um, so that's something that I think everybody should work on. If there, if there is a university in your area, develop that relationship and ask about work study. It usually is only on campus, but everybody wants to see people actually in their communities, which was the purpose of it originally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there I know that like our local um, biggest makerspace partnered with the university to do the economic impact study. So their like economy, our economics department did that for them. So I would love to work on that. Hopefully, we'll have time soon. <laughs> yeah, and and Meredith, I see your hand open, or say hand up, anyways. Hey, sweetlass, are y'all able to hear me all right? I know we have just bad yep, signal just, here right now. Yeah, just fine. Beautiful. Um. In terms of fundraising, thinking about the flip side of when that glorious, glorious money comes through and navigating taxes um, mm -hmm. and just all of the paperwork, do you have any recommendations about when we're manifesting yes. all this money and resources and funds that come through mm -hmm. to fuel the beautiful movement? Like pro bono accounting? Are there yeah. nonprofits that support with accounting and, and taxes? Because I've seen really beautiful donations and things, both that people take in their own names and then have to deal with mm -hmm. personal taxes in a big way. Uh, people have yeah. done it through LLC, people have done it through nonprofit and all the different ways. So if you have recommendations for when we manifest all these glorious resources coming our way, the, the mm -hmm. flip side, the backside round. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So my, yeah, my biggest recommendation is, is really try not to accept donations as an individual. If you can, um, if you can have any donations go to a nonprofit, they're not going to pay income tax on that. Um, so while nonprofits do have to file taxes, they don't have to pay taxes. Um, that's an oversimplification, but you don't need to, it's not like the more money you raise, the more tax you have to pay like you do with income. Um, so definitely set up that crowdfunding with, not your own social security number, but the EIN of a nonprofit. Um, you can find a fiscal sponsor. Um, we talked about that a little bit in our, um, our operations presentation. So that'll be available soon as a video if it's not already. If you want to kind of get the overview of like the tax benefits of different structures. Um, and then basic accounting is is actually relatively simple. So the IRS makes it very easy to file a 990EZ if you don't have a ton of income. Um, but I think that's a whole other topic, bookkeeping and accounting and, and taxes. Yeah. Yeah, I would recommend finding finding an accountant to be the treasurer of your board is a good place to start. Yeah, that's great. Great advice. And the other thing I was going to say, you know, there like with shareable, you know, we've been around for 15 years, the first 10 years of our organization, we were fiscally sponsored, you know, with staff and a regular budget and everything. And so there's a lot of benefit to working with a fiscal sponsor, having them take on 
all of that um that legal side of things um until mm-hmm. it doesn't make sense financially but until you have a real good budget and a stable organization a fiscal sponsor is i would say my my biggest suggestion on that front just to keep your your focus on the work and not on that back end stuff that you may not be as comfortable with Yeah, Amanda asked in the chat about um, donor CRM, which is a assistant relationship management software. Um, Whatever software you use to take online donations probably can be your CRM for a while if you pick a good one until you need to get really um, specific. I like GiveButter, as I mentioned. We use it for the donation form on our our website, which you can check out toolabrate.org if you want to see that in action. Um, It also does ticketing, auctions, crowdfunding, and you can send emails directly to people um, and it, it's free that I mentioned. So love that one. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Liana, for sharing that. Everyone for asking questions, uh, feel free to drop more questions through. I know Liana, you're gonna have to jump off before the end. So uh, if you can just stick around for a little while and answer some questions in the chat as they come, that'd be great, thank you. And yeah, uh, with that, we're gonna pass it off to Josh. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Josh Epstein. Um, if you don't know me, I'm the director for Seattle Reconomy. And um, then we manage the Shoreline and um, the Northeast Seattle Tool Library. And let me just get my screen going. Give me one second. Can folks see that? Great, okay, then I will jump in. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna talk about one case study, one uh, successful fundraiser that we've done several years now. And I really hope that other places take this on as well because it's uh, it's just been a huge benefit for the community. And I'll get into all the reasons why it's, it's more than just a fundraiser for us. But again, I'm from the Northeast Seattle and Shoreline Tool Library, and I'm going to be talking about our tool sales here. So this is the why of why we do tool sales for one of our fundraisers. Um, you know, we're trying to keep more tools out of the landfill, and we were finding that we had to turn away tools. People were bringing them. We didn't have the space for them. Our inventory was full, so we'd say, no, thank you. And then maybe those would get recirculated or stored, but maybe they'd go to the landfill. We were also helping folks buy used instead of new, so they don't need to deal with the packaging, the transportation, all of that good stuff. And then also um, they're saving money. And of course, what we're talking about today is uh, we made money. Um, finally, there's also a publicity aspect to it. I'll talk a little bit about how this can be a um, new member generator. We get new volunteers. Uh, it also keeps our other volunteers really engaged and it's it's just really fun. It's kind of like a holiday. Everybody looks forward to it. So uh, where we came from on this is we had just some extra tools. You know, our inventory kind of got a little too big. We took some of those extra tools and had a tool sale. And um, I imagine some other folks have tried this. Hopefully other folks have found some similar success. We were making under a thousand dollars, but again, it was still fun and worth it overall, but it wasn't a huge money maker. In 2021, there was more and more people coming to us with tools. And we thought this is an opportunity. We can not only make more money, but keep these tools from going into the landfill. So we just found storage space everywhere we could. We cleared out uh, high shelves and um, underneath the floorboards and we built a shed and we found this room over the bathroom. We just found wherever we could store tools. A volunteer offered up their garage to um, in one corner of it to uh, store some other stuff. And um, we found these great black bins. I'm not sure if these are universal, but around here, a lot of food banks have these really nice collapsible fold- folding bins that are very small and easily easy to um, store away when they're not filled with stuff. And when they are, they stack nicely if you don't fill to the top. So that was pretty essential is getting just dozens and dozens of those. 
And we put out a call and we just collected thousands and thousands of tools. It turned out um, there are a lot of people retiring, downsizing, people are passing away and their, you know, their loved ones have a garage full of stuff. So we also find that people want to give to us because we are a nonprofit. We are um, keeping the tools being used. So we've had a lot of folks who maybe a loved one passes away and they want their tool to be loved and used still. And so um, it's very meaningful that for them to pass it to a place where we're going to either be using it in our inventory or passing it on to somebody else who's going to use it. The first time we did this and collect all those tools, we made $5,000. So we thought we were uh, on the right track. We've expanded how many tools, how many volunteers. We do it twice a year now. Last year was by far our most successful. And um, we made just under $8,000 for our first, our spring tool sale. And then our uh, fall tool sale, we made $12,000. So $20,000 for the year. Here are some, here's the model. So we accept all working non-gas powered tools. Um, I think the one exception is um, radial arm saws. We have two of those and they take up too much space and they don't sell for a lot. So we don't uh, take those anymore unless they're exceptional. Uh, we try to get all of our volunteers involved, as many people as we can. Um, like I said, we also get some new volunteers through this. We usually have 40 to 50 people helping us in some capacity. It can be just doing a bake sale item, or it's actually helping with the organizing of it, or it's being there as a cashier or directing people as where to go. We sort all the tools the night before and lay them out on tables or in bins so they're easily stackable and sortable, cover those up. Um, where you're seeing here, that's the back of Northeast Seattle and nobody really goes back there in the night. So we can cover those up with a tarp and just lift off the tarp and go ready to go. We're having our next tool, uh, tool sale at Shoreline Tool Library, which is on a busy street. So we're gonna try a new model where we have everything inside and in a box truck and then get there early and pull it all out. But we're literally talking tens of thousands of tools. We moved to an Ikea style line where everybody tracks through and goes in the same path. And we found that that's made it really simple. And we also think it sells more because everybody sees every pretty much every item there is. Um, the big thing uh, that has worked for us is all offers accepted and all sales are final. So it's all on a donation basis. We don't price anything. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But uh, making sure that it's clear that these are donations are going to charity, that helps uh, with that model. And then we generally sell pretty much everything and we raise a bunch of money. We do have some stuff left over. We can do, you know, a goodwill run or Habitat for Humanity run if we, if with some stuff, but we have trucks on site ready for a, a dump run, maybe a metal recycling and other recycling run as well. So with that pricing thing, this is something that comes up every year. I actually have debates with volunteers and we go, no, it's working. Let's stick with it. Um, but they're always like, but don't you want to like, you know, price this thing? What about that? And I think we've made one exception. We got a, um, a like a $4,000 generator once, and it was also an exception to our gas powered stuff, but it was just too nice to not take. And we sold that um, just online uh, and made thousands of dollars. And I think we couldn't just put that up for whatever you want to pay. But the, there's a lot of benefit for doing it this way. We don't need to price anything, which with tens of thousands of tools would take forever. Um, we find that we, we think people are actually giving more because like Liana was saying, there is a great feeling when they're saying, oh, I'm not only getting this tool, but I'm giving to charity. This feels good. Um, and because it's a donation and it's totally optional, uh, we don't need to pay taxes on it. Um, just a little quick thing about advertising. Uh, email distribution list is probably our main way we do it. We started doing just a, a small $50 ad on Facebook. And when people were coming through, we were asking how they heard about us. And that ended up being um, just about as much as our email distribution list. So it was all new people though. So that was huge. So I recommend that if you have an event you really want people to come for, there might be some ad, whether Facebook or otherwise, not that I love Facebook, but it did the job um, that might be worth it for you. Of course, word of mouth, we make little quarter sheets and have everybody come in. Everybody's coming the month before we're telling them about it. Please spread the word, put this on your refrigerator. We have signage like any kind of like rummage sale or garage sale. We use places like next door and everywhere, anywhere you can. Just a few more details. Um, we do this as a one day event uh, from nine to three. 
we do it twice a year and in, in Seattle, basically we're trying to do it as late as we can, or sorry, as early as we can in May that we think that there might not be um, rain. So late May for us. And then again, late September where we think it's safe enough that it's not going to dump on us, but um, that gives us the most space in between to collect tools. We try to keep it simple. We're always tempted to make do t-shirt making and apple cider pressing and all this stuff. And generally speaking, there's so much logistics to it that we just try to keep it simple. We do do a bake sale. It doesn't make a ton of money. We do a bake sale with this tool sale. It makes a little bit of money, but it also just really is helps with the atmosphere. So it's worth it to do it to us and keeps people happy. Sometimes there is a line. Um, but yeah, we, we use this also as a membership and volunteer recruitment event. So we make sure we have tablets out for folks to sign up for membership. We'll, we're doing tours in the tool library. We are signing up volunteers on the spot. Um, so that's a really huge benefit to this too. Um, we have, I sent a volunteer sign-up sheet that we use uh, to Candice. So um, if you want to throw that in the, uh, in the chat, folks can look at what that looks like. You're welcome to steal from that. We have other notes. Uh, I didn't want to get it. it, it I'm, I got the real, I think the strongest points in here. There's a lot of details that are specific to us, but if you want to chat with me or you want some more notes, feel free to reach out. So that's just, that's my case. It's um, a little uh, example, of how to make some money and create some community. And I highly encourage you all to do it because for us, it's been, it's been good. Thanks, Josh. Um, before we move off of this one, I want to, there's some good questions kind of coming in the chat here so we can keep that, that coming. Um, I'm wondering, do you offer your volunteers? And I use, you mentioned that you've got a lot of volunteers, um, for each one of these sessions. Do you offer the volunteers a first pass on the tools or how do you, how do you kind of manage, um, one bringing in that many volunteers, but also not necessarily have, not having volunteers take all the great stuff right from the beginning. We have so much stuff that it's not really an issue, but yes, that is a really nice incentive. Like there's, we need, uh, a couple dozen folks just for the sorting process. And that's kind of a party. We get pizza and like it, there's a, it's fun. But we say, yeah, if you do that while you're sorting, everybody's creating their own little piles of tools and it's fine. Like, I mean, we want them to be as happy as possible. And, yeah. um, you know, they can, it's suggested donation. We say, you can just take that stuff. Often they give us money too, because they love what we're doing. That's why they're volunteering with us. But we make it clear that the work that they're doing, they can, they can just, you know, unless they're getting everything, um, they can just take it. But yeah. That's how we, yeah, we let them have a pass. Mm -hmm. They always get a couple tools, but there's just so many tools in this world. It's not an issue. Yeah. And how are you taking uh, donations for those items, you know, through yeah. digital payments, cash? Yeah. Like, what does that look like? Both. Digital and, who's and, and, and who's taking that? Who's Yeah, who's we have volunteers. We have, yeah, we have, a, um, we have cashiers that are volunteers at the end of the line um, doing um, Stripe and also just cash. And, um, and certainly we're, we're trying to do as much tracking as we can. So we're getting a sense of what's working and what's not, but, um, most of it's digital payments, uh, or credit card payments. You can just either, you can go to our website and just donate through that, or you can, we also have, uh, card readers so you can do credit card. Got it. Let's see, just check to see any other questions that are coming through. Any, anyone else have any questions about this model and, or. For more, you know, because there's a lot of folks that have that are doing um, that are maybe still in that same space that Josh and and the crew were a few years ago, um, where it's you know maybe 500, 700, 800, maybe a thousand is like a as like a goal. Any other questions about how just like how how that pivot kind of grew? Yeah, we. How the, yeah. Go okay. ahead. Um. The pivot was, it was instantaneous for us. Like it was just a decision really like the knowing that that's, that we wanted to do something with these tools, the how kind of followed, like I know space, like I think the biggest thing is space and volunteers, honestly. And I think it's so fun that volunteers want to get involved and, um, space it really depends on where you're at if you're just out of a shipping container and that's really all the space you got i know that that can be really tricky um but maybe 
there's a little Rubbermaid shed you could create, or maybe there's somebody with a garage or there's some new shelves you can put up. But I mean, I know there's not always space, but that's what I suggest. We thought we were full and now we're more full, but I think we can always find there's always these nooks and crannies. But I do think just stockpiling the stuff and figuring out how to do that efficiently is the first step. Um, and then setting a date, making it happen. Here's a, uh, a final question for you before we, we move on is, um, you know, oftentimes when people donate to a tool library, a nonprofit or something, they're hoping that that unit is going to get used by that group. You know, we talked about earlier, like it's a, it's a way of, of participating in yeah. the work saying, okay, this is something I can offer. Have you had any trouble where there's been folks that have donated items and then they've seen them up on the, the giveaway, you know, donation table and been like, Hey, I thought that was going to get used by the library. Uh, no, we haven't. And we do make it clear. Like if, if we're getting a big donation of stuff, like generally you find people just want to support the tool library and yeah. we will make it clear if there's a bunch of stuff and we'll look in and we're like, yeah, we absolutely will take that. Just so you know, it's not, some of it will go to inventory, but a lot of this might go to our tool sale, which is a big fundraiser and keeps us going. And them knowing that like, well, somebody's going to be using this tool and this helps the tool library. In some ways, people are more happy about that depending mm -hmm. on the person. Um, but making that clear is is nice. We also have had people say like, hey, I'm going to donate this. Um, you know, I might want it back later. Will you make sure it's here in a year? And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not, if you give it to us, we're going to do what we need to do with it and it might break and it might get stolen and we're going to do our best. But like, that's not, that's not what this is. Um, somebody asked like, if we take uh, broken tools, very, very, very rarely, we have so many of our own broken tools that our fixers are working on trying to keep going that that's one of the few things we can't do. Like we don't take any tools without all the batteries and chargers. Um, but this is also nice an outlet for like, we try to have only nicer battery operated tools and try to keep them in somewhat similar brands. Uh, but now if we can get a tool that has the battery and the charger, we can sell that off and people really like that, but we won't take it if it doesn't have that. We don't test everything. So that's why we say all sales, all offers are uh, accepted and all sales are final. Um, we do have a testing station, but if you borrow some, if you buy something from us, we just say, you know, you're not sure if it works and you don't want to test it. Just um, this is your risk and just pay, pay us very little. That's fine. We spent very little effort to get it and get rid of it. So give us very little, take that risk or don't. And people can make that choice. All right. I think we're going to end on that one. Thank you, Josh. Wait, Josh, I didn't say oh, anything oh. about Ridwell. Oh yeah. Got to mention Ridwell. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, last year, one of the reasons why we we're so successful last year was that we have a partnership with Ridwell, which you might have in your town, or there might be some similar thing. Ridwell does hard to recycle items. So you put a box out in your front you can put like batteries and light bulbs and that kind of thing. And they do, they have community partnerships where they will work with a community organization that can take a certain kind of item. So Amanda and I were working with Ridwell and they um, collected a whole bunch of tools for us. And we each got four pallets of tools, um, which was great for us because we were starting our new tool library. So some of our tools went to that, some went to the tool sale. And um, that was hugely, hugely successful. And I think we'll try to do that every other year with them if they're open to it. Um, this year with starting a new tool library, we actually have more tools than we've ever had, even more than Ridwell had gotten with those four pallets of tools. But yeah, Ridwell's awesome. So I recommend looking for something like that as a partner if you're looking for more tools. But we also just find putting out a call, it's crazy how many tools are out in this world. All right. Well, thank you so much. I think we're going to use that as an opportunity to transition and going to hand it over to Amanda. All right. Sorry. Trying to get everything to cooperate today. You guys seeing my screen yet? It's still loading. It's still loading. Okay. All right. Oh, I'm but Amanda Miller. Here we, here okay. we are. We, we, we got, we're at the, at the beginning of the presentation. Oh, well, that's not perfect, but oh, well, now give me a second. I'm Amanda Miller. Um, I'm the executive director, there I am, uh, of the South King Tool Libraries uh, in Federal Way in Auburn. And yes, we use those four pallets to open the Auburn Tool Library, um, which was a lot. Uh, and 
it was very surprising. We did not go to Portland to answer uh, the question in the chat. It was just King County, if you can believe that. So King County houses, uh, I think I showed you guys a map at one point, Seattle to uh, Tacoma and has quite a lot of folks in it. Sorry, I'm clicking all the way through the presentation for you guys. But save the best, most exciting for last. There we go. All right, operational budgeting, seed to sustaining. Okay, um, so thanks guys. Um, yeah, such a great, you know, uh, predecessors here. So I have a lot to cover. I by no means expect to go entirely into everything I have here. I wanted to put all the thoughts into the slides so you guys could go back and look at these again later. Um, you could get an idea. Um, my style of teaching is like, you have to figure it out anyway. So I'm going to tell you as much information and give you the good grounds to stand on. So uh, Leanna and Josh are great. Um, partners and folks that I've worked with and Lana referenced me a few times. So hoping I can tie things in. First and foremost, just like you guys have heard probably multiple times, uh, centering and setting your priorities, even for a budget. I know it's silly. Budgets are tedious. What is a budget? There's so many different kinds. We're going to go with the operational pieces. So um, Lana had some great examples for fundraising uh, that plays into this as well. But making sure at all times centering, you know, what your mission vision, um, breaking it apart into what I've called buckets, uh, and then a timeline to really hold yourself accountable and the realities of uh, the limitations that come with those as well. So maybe here. Sources for startups. There are a lot of them. They are sexy. It's exciting. People want to do things that are new and fresh and on the ground. So um, look to grants, uh, especially grants, because a lot of grants are project-based. So if you're starting out from the ground up, uh, then you might want to consider segmenting what you want to do uh, into projects and then pursue grants to, to do those things that um, line up with them. Also pre-sale, I've seen some really adap adaptive uh, models uh, about adoption of tools. Uh, I don't think we ever really want to see a Coca-Cola like tool library, but you know, naming rights have been tossed around as ideas. Uh, and then, you know, maybe there is a fairy godmother father sort of situation, find a venture capitalist, sponsorship, donations, uh, you know, those are individuals and folks that really want to see this, uh, your mission and vision take off. So um, there we go. Buckets, very not exciting again, <laughs> but um, I think it kind of is because my brain, I need to sort things. So um, to help you start formulating this budget, even at the seed level, even at the beginning, even before you have any tools in hand or any things in hand, uh, consider you know these kind of categories, these higher level pieces, that's the space, operations, and people. I put the secret fourth bucket down there of things because that is not something that is necessarily, um, it, it's a process. So we'll come back to that in a minute, but um, had to add my little bucket guy in there to make it more exciting. Uh, so space, um, also wanted to point out, I added a lot of little things here, kind of went crazy, but bear with me. Come back to this later if you want to. Uh, capacity and insurance, because insurance is something that we talk about all the time as tool libraries and as libraries of things, because it's a big question, it's a big unknown, it's a big um, you know, thing that sits over our shoulders sometimes. So just understand it can be incremental, it can be in parts and it doesn't have to be perfect. So high level space, storage rentals, signage, doesn't seem like it's as important, but actually really is if you're central on a bus line or if you're hidden in the, middle of you know, uh, private property, you might need to have some directional things. So making that hierarchy for yourselves and then uh, making sure that you're doing due diligence to hammer out all of the pieces that are going to go into your budget. Um, so like I said, considering these things when you're going into a budget, uh, you're going to have to look at the lofty goals, expectations, and then the reality of 
all of them. And of course, centering your alignment. So um, the little gray section there is specialization because things like, I don't know, building a shipping container building or being in a mall come with their own problems. Like you can't just put a shelf up on the side of a shipping container and you can't just be noisy when the mall is open. Apparently people don't like that, but um, so, you know, that will come with, with the, uh, uh, as things move along. The next sort of bucket is people. And even if you don't have staff, you are people, uh, we are people. And so you will expend capacity. You will spend time recruiting more people like you, smart people, smarter than you people, um, volunteers and coordination of those things is pretty indispensable in a lot of the operations of nonprofits, of course, but um, especially when you're trying to lead the community. So uh, as you're going and breaking down what kind of people uh, funds you wanna to drive towards your projects, consider what it would take. Um, how many people do you have working at, at this goal already? And is it something that you can keep your hands around as you grow, as you get more capacity? Um, and then those sort of eventualities down there in gray where you have, you know, software management coordination for volunteers, you might want to invest in something that's transactional and reminds your volunteers to show up for their shifts and reminds, uh, keeps their contact information secure. Um, and then on, you know, again, insurance, just an inevitability because it comes up as questions too. Um, and let's see, operations. So this is this is the exciting part, right? Um, operationally, you can let someone borrow something without having any sort of institution behind you. But as you grow and develop and establish yourself as this entity, um, you are going to have operational costs that go uh, along with things. Of course, the more you open to the public, the more different programs you have. And each of those should have kind of separate buckets. But falling under your operations, you can list out all your dreams and goals and ideas. And what you want to do is put a for now and a for later kind of priority to it. So um, another, you know, capacity and insurance element to all of these things, because it's going to take time to manage every piece of it, uh, including if you're making your own or, you know, organizational development of bylaws and articles of incorporation or marketing, you know, that's still your time. Um, and we were talking a little bit about uh, tracking and, you know, even tracking that because your time is important and your volunteers time is important. So making sure that that is something that is on the radar as well. So um, the fees again, unseen, we were talking a little bit about the sales and about fundraising and fees that come along with that. So sales tax is a tricky um, one to consider. Uh, fiscal sponsorship fees also, you know, fiscal sponsorships are great. We started out also as a fiscal sponsored pro program. Um, and the problems that can arise, you know, you can mitigate those by, again, due diligence with your agreements and um, taking the time to maybe, you know, dream board goals. You have an accountant, you got a lawyer on there, you got like a web dev guy, you got, uh, you know, tool library folks that are real tool heavy. So when you're building out all of these pieces, it really plays into what you have at hand. If you have great volunteers at hand that are able to jump in and work through some of these, it might save you money in the long run. Um, and then TechSoup, uh, we already kind of talked about that a little too. So, all right. So much to cover here, <laughs> all the things, because uh, inevitably we want to talk about my world is tools. I use tools very broadly. Libraries of things are things, but this is the best infographic I could really find. It's more of a spirally circle that kind of eats on itself over and over again, because the stuff is going to come to you and you're going to figure out and have to figure out what to do with it. And that's the, you know, Terminality is inevitable, uh, recycling parts. But if you don't sort of have a plan, have a policy in place as far as what that will be, it can cost you money in the long run. If you are maybe recycling metal instead of doing a tool sale, are you losing out on opportunities because you could be uh, generating more income? So I wanted you to keep that as sort of a secondary uh, element 
when you're considering what the, the budget in whole would look like. So allocating time for all of these elements and, and talent, of course, as well. So. Mm -mm. so buckets, if you don't get anything else from this whole spiel, take a picture of this one. This is like the thing. Um, this is when you're starting to getting operative and further and beyond. Um, but this is really bare bones. I have some examples coming up to, to go with you guys too. But you can see people costs, asset costs, outreach, business, and then revenues. And being specific helps again to um, track and analyze what is working and what's not. Um, you know, if a credit card processor charges a higher fee than a different one, you can make a change and maybe make a little more on the back end. So um, revenue. I just wanted to touch on this before we go to uh, some other examples. Uh, yes, more money, more problems can be a thing because that is not always what is going to serve your organization the best. Um, so let's get into a little bit more about the, the negatives, the deltas, if you want to be uh, technical about it here. Fundraisers. Um, you can burn out your base. Uh, you know, Leanna has shared some really great uh, insights into how to keep that fresh and going. Grants are slippery slope. Um, you can miss deadlines, break rules, judge it, uh, miss judgments on budget allocations. Uh, a lot of them are reimbursement based. A lot of them are not renewable. So there's some short term viability to those. Uh, Presale, if you miscommunicate uh, or don't have the same um, alignments down the line. And again, you know, trying to continue with brand alignments can change over time as well. So um, sustaining your funding. So continuing after you've opened and you getting things moving is relationships, right? This is uh, the basis of everything we're doing. So, you know, the effort that you have to take and time to pursue those things, maybe you're joining business groups or maybe you're joining other community um, networking opportunities. Um, you wanna make sure you're doing that diligently, but also not in the same sort of circles. You have to understand the markets are gonna vary. Um, and then looking again, reflectively at how, who is benefiting from the work, um, who, you know, what new projects and funding is coming out um, and then diversification, of course, that's um, a given for a lot of businesses and even nonprofits. So ongoing budget, um, you know, budgets are living, breathing things. They are um, helping and tools as well, but uh, you want to definitely consider what the ongoing budgets are. You don't want to wait to the last minute to have a budget for something. All of those funding sources are usually going to require budgets and tracking. So it seems like there's a lot of numbers involved and a lot of um, redundancy, but it helps to make sure that you're telling the story. And it's important to make sure that you are not misrepresenting yourself as you. And then I throw up here, just as hot takes for you guys to see, this is our, on the left, our 2019 budget. Um, you can see we have two high level buckets expenses and revenues, and then the breakdown there. And then on the right-hand side is wild uh, because we had five grants under every level of government as well as contracts and many other things. So I just wanna show you the difference that a few years can make in an organization and how you divvy up the budgets for uh, those entities. And I can definitely share those with you guys. We're pretty transparent. There's also living documents. So. Uh, as you go along, you have analysis that goes back and does year to dates and actualizes, uh, answers those questions too. So you can see on the left-hand side, we have the budget and the actual and, oh, we're negative. That's crazy. I'll explain why in a minute, but <laughs> um, eventually you're going to add more budgets. You're going to add more buckets. You're going to add more different types of budgets to things. So your initial uh revenues and expenses will keep sort of um, breaking down as you get more expansive and more uh, obligations as well. Uh, you might also consider the leadership management of these things. Who's gonna own it? Who's going to verify it? 
you have treasurer, uh, most likely on a board of directors or your organization as you're developing. Um, you might also eventually want to bring on a paid position that's managing some of the elements. So have that clear line of checks and balances in line. Uh, I threw in some big words over on the other side as far as uh, policies. And so as you negotiate different contracts and agreements, there are things that you'll come across you do have to have for handling things like government contracts, uh, whistleblower grievance, conflict of interest, uh, and even that 2 CFR 200, which is, I don't know. I don't really know. I put a link to it in the end here. It's it's a it's a wordy thing from the IRS. So um, but always anticipating the unexpected too. There are countless two libraries that I have talked to that had to relocate. Um, there's always problems happening, break-ins. So um, accounting for how that can affect you and what that is going to mean um, can be the difference between your, you know, longevity or having to really pivot or completely dissolve your organization. So um, accrual versus cash. So that negative number, um, there are different types of accounting processes. You have accrual. And like I mentioned, some of those grants are reimbursement based. So you can be spending money and not bringing in the money in the same time period. Sometimes not in the same quarter, sometimes not even in the same year. Um, but that's why having that policy in place can help you make sure that you understand what your money is doing, how it's working for you, and then creating things like uh, quantifying your uh, um, uh, programs and tracking and reporting only do things like benefit your uh, outcomes. Um, I do like giving people numbers when they are, when I'm talking to like service groups, uh, because I think it does play well to folks that are looking at investing or, or donating a little bit. Um, but something like a three to one return on investment for our uh, outcomes. So we've calculated something like $1.2 million has been saved by the community in our four years of operation. And uh, we take that number and just compare it to how much we have actually spent um, in every category. So you can plug in what works for now and then make it better as you keep going. Cash flow is another one that helps to balance those accruals in cash as well. And there's a cat because those words are boring mostly. So that's exciting. Um, but there, I finished, yay. Um, and I just wanted to throw in some links that I thought might be helpful. Some of those big words. Um, I'm trying to find if there is like a uh, succinct summary for insurance providers because you generally do have to add like your depreciation uh, versus donated values. And uh, we weigh everything as well. So I think that's something that comes into other conversations about reporting and metrics. But um, I think that helps us make sure that we're not missing out on a lot when it comes to uh, tracking. And yeah, there's some government links and lots of other things I could probably keep talking about, but I will stop because I did it kind of. I was still over. Sorry. Okay. So much great content. So hard to pack it all into a 20 minute run. And that's actually one of the things that we uh, are going to be, I think, Candace, you're going to post that, that uh, poll. So uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing over, after these 12 weeks are over is having for the rest of the year, a series of additional trainings once per month. And we wanted this to be emergent. And so we haven't scheduled those out yet. But there's a poll active right now. Hopefully you can see it and you're contributing uh, your suggestions to there. Are there aspects around fundraising that you were especially interested in making sure that we host a follow-up uh, full-length session on um, later this summer or fall for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere? And while you're filling out that, um, that poll, thank you for doing that. There was also... I believe, um, Candace, you posted the assessment survey just a few moments ago at 158. If you're looking through the chat, uh, again, we're looking for, uh, please, any additional feedback you can provide on this session um, or the sessions as a whole. Um, we try to collect this every week, and it actually really does uh, help out a lot. All right. We're four minutes over. 
but there was just so much in that presentation. And I want to make sure that those of you who have questions, we're, we're sticking around um, for a few more minutes to, to discuss it. I uh, wondering anybody have any questions for Amanda? Um, and they're coming in right now. All right. Well, one thing that I was just kind of hoping that you could, um, check in about, or, or to maybe talk a little bit more about is those, um, relationships that you have, um, cultivated with large funders. And, you know, you talked about that difference from one year to the next or one, you know, from one, one of those billing cycles, um, pulling that back up from 2019 to what was that? 2023. Those were the, the, the two jumps. And I wonder if, yeah, if you can talk a little bit about how you have been able to, uh, build relationships, especially with government agencies, and be able to kind of bring in large amounts of sustaining funding. Yeah. So um, the you know the questions are always with grants. They are um, project based, and they are not usually renewable. But um, I think Leanna said this too. You know, they are humans. They are people, and they generally want to do good work. And when you find the alignments, then they tend to reach out and reconnect with you. They, um, uh, when you, you know, there is turnover too, you know, government right now is also having a lot of tumultuousness and not all governments are the same. So I understand that, um, that, you know, there are totally different dynamics in a lot of areas, but, um, I think what, really has been successful for us is diversifying and that reflection piece. I kind of glazed over this point, but it was pretty important. And that's, you know, who is benefiting from your service? Who is the, who are the people that are um, actually getting the most value out of what you're doing? And so, you know, we found alignments because the city's solid waste divisions and the county ha has a solid waste division. Um, we draw that correlation between, um, uh, you know, waste diversion, and we can bring in things like uh, greenhouse gas emissions and global, uh, you know, uh, impact with tonnage. Um, and then the, I think also that answers a question of like, you know, a lot of communities that are marginalized and that are not usually included in conversations like this because we, they don't maybe have the time capital or even have uh, the ability. So it's important to know, like, you can't possibly do it all. So don't find the right people to plug into. So um, building a brand around that is pretty important and making sure that your um, message is clear and carried over. Uh, you know, Leanna's templates were great. And, you know, uh, I'm going to make my board look at everything that she said. Uh, but, you know, having that that elevator pitch, having those uh, opportunities, putting numbers to your successes. I can't say that enough because I think that's what we tend to not do. We shy away from as nonprofits. We're like, oh, we're working super hard. But when you're like 180 tons of carbon, is that important? Okay. Just wanted to make sure, you know, that's, that gets people's attention. And um, yeah, taking those risks uh, would be the other thing is just not being shy because uh, even your legislators are still humans, whether you like them or not. So, yeah. And with the kind of the grant outreach, um, are you creating essentially, well, I don't, I'm, maybe I'm going to lead you in this question. So um, I'll say that at Shareable, we oftentimes will look at the project budget, right? Like what really would cost if everybody was paid fairly for their time? If we were to spend um, the market rate for the mm -hmm. items and the materials we need to be able to do the project, knowing full well yeah. that if we don't get that full amount, we're going to figure out a way to use volunteers, to get used items, whatever it's going to take to be able to still do that project if it's something that we care about. Wondering when you're doing that kind of uh, budgeting for these grants, are you budgeting in for the fair market value of volunteer hours? Are you like what kind of pieces are you including in those in those budgets yeah i kind of debated adding more but i was like too much already all right uh but there's something that i think is a keyword if 
again, one word, just remember this overhead. Ooh, it's a magic word because that is something that can, uh, you know, make an entire difference, but absolutely like adding value to all of the volunteer hours, uh, quantifying that and making sure that those are reflected in any budget that you're calculating, whether it's uh, on the cost side or if it's on your post, like, you know, in a formal budget, you might not want to put those in, but in an annual report, you absolutely could because those are calculable hours that people were working. And if you just go based on, uh, you know, local minimum wage, or if you go based on half time, then, you know, that's still an, an undervaluation of what you've done. Um, and I would say the same for things like checkouts, uh, because, you know, whether you're somebody might not you might not be running preventing them from going and buying this new but there's not a calculable way uh to to know when that is the case and when that's not the case and so the more we do the the better it's going to to feed into all of those elements so yeah I just put that in the chat, chat that I think the current estimated national value of each volunteer hour is $31 and 80 cents. And so that's the, you know, the worth of that in-kind contribution, as you were saying, you could include mm -hmm. in the, in the end of your reports and everything else, um, which, you know, if we had a, a, a base salary of, of $31 and 80 cents, I think, uh, we'd be living in a very different society. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole another segment. If you get into grant reporting and management where there's, you know, um, in-kind donations, valuations, but also with the overhead and those as match funds. So a lot of places would like to see match funds. And so whether you are putting those into your formal budget, uh, which is kind of what I gave you guys the, the overview of or if you're putting that into your projected project budgets, then that would be the um, the difference there to see, well, why is this program cost in paper, you know, this much, but in our, you know, uh, expenses side only costs this much. So um, yeah, it seems when I dove into this, I don't have a background in nonprofit. I have a background in a lot of different things, but I, uh, I thought it was a little bit of a, a game uh, and uh, it was a little bit of this, this sort of, you know, puppet show look over here, not over here. And you don't want to, you don't want to do that. You're good people. That's why you're here. That's not part of what you do. But when it comes to numbers and looking at projections, we also don't seem to value as a society, the right things. And we are stewards of that, right? We're trying to enhance the value and the uh, value versus cost elements. So um, yeah, I think that's something else that I could have talked about for another half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Any last questions before we, we wrap up? Well, want to thank everyone for joining us. Want to especially thank Amanda and Josh and Liana for speaking to us all once again and bringing their expertise, uh, from the libraries they're working with and in Washington and, state and also in Maryland. Um, and just the, the years of experience that is kind of coming from this larger hive mind of established uh, libraries of things that are joining us on this journey. So thank you all for being good stewards, not only of your own libraries of things, but also of the larger library of things movement. We really appreciate it. And we'll be back here once again next week, same time, same place. And uh, we will be talking about governance and how to weave that into the relationships within a library of things, uh, from volunteers to members, uh, boards, and when applicable staff. So please join us again for that next week. And as, as always, this recording will find its way onto Canvas within the next uh, 48 hours. And, um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all so much.